Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Yourself Healthy podcast. I'm your host, Heather Duranja. Let's dive into today's episode. Hello, everybody. On today's episode of Think Yourself Healthy, I have Dr. Nicole Morris. She is the founder of Morris Natural Health, located in Romeo, Michigan. She works with women through individualized healing programs to balance their hormones, poop every day, reverse anxiety, and live their best lives. Dr. Morris is a strong advocate for medical freedom and choice. She devotes most of her time and energy to bringing awareness and support to moms struggling to be heard and respected and empowers them to make the choices for their own health and that of their children. What a beautiful bio. Thank you. There's, Thank you for having me. Yeah, My pleasure. You know, honestly, reading your bio, I was just like falling in love with you thinking, wow, here is a person who is so clear about their purpose and has so much clarity around their mission and what they're meant to be doing to help heal this world. Such, such beauty. Thank you. It's, it was a journey to get here, but I always say like most of us in this space of healing have our own journey that brought us to where we are so that makes it a little the vision a little bit more clear what we want to empower others especially women to be able to do in their lives so thank you and i'm excited to be here and chat with you and uh, bust some of those myths that we were mentioning previously and go from there yes so first and foremost um tell me a little bit about what did bring you down the pathway of practicing you know yeah, having your own That's practice true. Yeah. So um, as a child, I would say it really goes back to my childhood. So from the time I was a year old, I was diagnosed with ITP, which is a low platelet count. So I spent a lot of time in the hospital until I was about five years old. And my mom was really ahead of the curve. She studied homeopathy when I was a kid. She didn't let us eat food coloring. And for being in my early thirties, like she was really, really ahead of the curve there. Right. So um, I always joked that she was the witch doctor and (laughs) was going to hell. Um, but then like somehow I ended up here. <laughs> um, so then uh, <clears throat> into high school, I had mono a few times, was very sick, honestly, especially probably my senior year in high school, um, had a lot of fatigue, a lot of bone pain, uh, couldn't, couldn't really do a lot of things that I wanted to be able to do. Uh, still remember the day I went to a naturopath, not a naturopathic doctor, more of a traditional naturopath. Uh, and he told me to stop eating gluten. And I was just about to go to my freshman year of college and I'll never forget the day, like so vividly. Right. And I thought that he was crazy and <laughs> there was no way I was going to go to college and I eat gluten. Right. So fast forward through college, got married right after college. I was young. I was 21 when I got married, almost 22. Um, and we couldn't get pregnant. So that was really like the core of what really started my journey. So Mm -hmm. as soon as we got married, I said, because I was still in pain all the time, dealing with all of the fatigue, that sort of thing. I decided, all right, I am, I'm going to do it. I'm going to stop eating gluten. So stopped eating gluten about 11 years ago, I would say. Yeah. 11, 11 years ago. Um, And then, like I said, we couldn't get pregnant for four years. So for four years we tried and I just really felt unsupported, unheard, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of neglected by the conventional medical system. And I was, I was young, right? I was in my early twenties trying to figure out this infertility journey and they didn't really want to help me other than giving me drugs and telling me to drink Ensure, (laughs) which if you read the ingredients, it's corn syrup and soy and like other stuff I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole. Mm -hmm. I didn't know better at the time. So I did drink it. Um, and then I worked, I studied business. I was doing all these other things and I was continuously always searching, like Google searching, like what, there's gotta be a way that you can be a doctor and help people naturally. Right. Mm -hmm. And one day I just finally stumbled upon it. It was like, God's time for me. I found it in a Google search and that was in May. And by December, we had moved from Michigan to Oregon and I was starting medical school. So wow. it was fast once it happened, but it was meant to be. Yeah, uh, that's so that's beautiful. a little bit of my journey, how I got there. And then six months into medical school, I was pregnant with my first. So. Oh, congratulations. Hey. Well, that's beautiful. I, I love the fact that you had so much conviction that you knew that something was off, that the way that the Western model was not really 
addressing the root of the cause and that you, um, you know, decided that you were going to make it your mission to help others. And that's exactly what I did. You know, my story is very similar. I got diagnosed at 18 with IGA nephropathy had been Mm. pretty sick. Most of my childhood, lots of depression, lots of anxiety, grew up addicted to sugar. My mom, unfortunately Mm. did not know any better. And, um, they told me I only had five years. And so that was the motivation. They said transplant or dialysis. And at that time I couldn't get health insurance because I had a pre-existing condition and was not a full-time college student. So it was a mess. And there was an intuitive knowing within me. They told me there was nothing I could do to change that prognosis. And there was an intuitive knowing within me that said, I cannot accept that as my fate and reality. And so we're going to see. And ultimately it led me down a beautiful path, which encouraged me to uh, pursue becoming a registered dietitian nutritionist and really helping to support those out there that do feel lost. Food is such a huge component of our health. I mean, it's, it's foundational and it's one of the most over abused and under addressed issues in the United States. So (laughs) it's sad enough and sad it's because it's, because it's gone so much further than just the U S and it's impacting so many countries, you know? Um, so my friend, we have a lot of work to do. We do. It's just getting started. We have a lot of work to do. I I just love what you're doing. And, um, recently I just love your work by the way, on social media. I think that you you. have a really great message and your, your conviction is just so attractive. I'm like this chick, I like this. (laughs) So, I mean, that's probably my biggest mission aside from really trying to help women get pregnant without IVF and IUI is to just really empower other women Mm -hmm. because in the family unit, right? Like that's where it starts. At least that's what I see in my practice too, is like mom will come in first. Mm -hmm. And then before I know it, I'm seeing her kids. And then sometimes the husband's coming in too, right? So if we can empower other women to use their voice in medicine and to know that the reference ranges weren't developed for them, they were developed for middle-aged white men and that's Mm -hmm. a problem, right? Right. And so when they're encouraged and we're not leaving them to feel like they're crazy, like the medical, the conventional model Mm -hmm. wants moms often to think that they're wrong and crazy Mm -hmm. when we're encouraging them and supporting them and helping them find their voice. Like the whole paradigm can change. The whole picture of health can change for generations, honestly. Absolutely. So helping women feel empowered in the truth and their voice comes first for me. And that's really, I feel like what my like strongest mission is, is to just empower women to do their research, to speak up, to not feel stupid just because they're not the doctor, because that's just ridiculous. Right. You you can find anything online. Yeah, absolutely. I've learned you can find online outside of clinical experience. Right. Absolutely. Well, I, I just love this. I love your story. And there are so many women out there, young ladies. So I, I myself have a 26 year old and almost, well, actually 21 year old now. And both of my girls, um, you know, I really advocated for them to never get on birth control. Mm -hmm. And so this became a pretty big argument amongst myself and my ex-husband and within the family unit, because I was trying to explain to them, birth control is not what you think it is. Like birth control is a huge problem and they're going to suffer for decades, you know, their, their whole life outcome could potentially be compromised by putting them on this medication at a very early age. And so, um, I'm very fortunate that now neither of my daughters are on birth control and have been able to manage their cycles and improve them just through doing lifestyle changes. Yeah. But I think that there, you know, is a lot of women out there that are desperate for help. They have terrible cramps. They, you know, uh, they're debilitated, have to miss work, can't go to school. And they go to the doctor with all of these complaints and they leave with a prescription as their only option. Every time. Every time. Right. And there is no con, there is no honest conversation about what this medication they're handing to this young being is going to do to them and their body. 
So right. I would love to dive into some yeah, of the myths around some of the, the unspoken truths about birth control, if you're open to that. Yeah, absolutely. So to kind of start off of what you're saying is in a sense, I don't condone the conventional model for that because mm-hmm. it's all they know, right? Mm-hmm. It's all they're mm-hmm. taught. But at the same time as humans, like, and as a physician, you have the ability to be inquisitive and to do more and to be better and to learn more for your patients. So that kind of all goes together. And I think a really good place to start is that birth control, whether it's oral birth control an IUD, whatever form of birth control that you're using that's hormonal or not hormonal, if it's like a copper IUD, it doesn't fix, it doesn't fix your period problems. It suppresses them. Mm-hmm. So again, like birth control does not fix your period problems. It suppresses that. If we don't deal with the root cause of why you have period problems in the first place today, right now, we can put you on birth control for the next 15 years. And then when you come off birth control before you're going to go into menopause, we still have to clean the mess up then, but then you haven't had hormones for 15 years. So now you're at greater risk of osteoporosis and all kinds of other conditions that no one tells you about. And if you go on birth control when you are 15 years old or 16 years old, then you might go off birth control in five, 10, 15 years when you want to get pregnant. And well, you might, that might not be easy because your hormones have been suppressed for the last five, 10, 15 years. And essentially it's like, if you went on birth control when you were 15 years old and then you come off, it's almost like your body has to go through puberty all over again, Mm -hmm. because it's got to connect that, that brain ovary connection has to turn back on. And for some women, yeah, that turns right on and they might get pregnant the next cycle. For other women, it could be years before that connection is fully turned on, like that light switch turns back on and that connection is, is reconnected. So, so I think the, the biggest thing, and I would say like in the whole conversation that we're going to have today, from my perspective, at least like the biggest thing to take away is birth control does not fix your period problems. It suppresses them. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a provider and you have cramps, heavy bleeding, passing clots, PMS symptoms. Maybe you have PMDD, which is like PMS on steroids, right? You like raging and having intense symptoms and your provider says, let's put you on birth control to regulate your hormones. That's like a red flag, right? Like (laughs) out the door. That's not, it will suppress. You may feel better, but it's not digging in and fixing the root cause of what's going on. And if we can Mm -hmm. do that right now, the health, your future health will be so much greater mm-hmm. in so many different ways. So you mentioned a really important statement that typically doctors will say with initiating birth control, and that's that it will regulate our hormones. <laughs> So I know a lot of individuals are taking birth control pills with this impression that it's actually hormones that they're taking in and supporting their hormone Mm -hmm. balance. So can you talk to the audience a little bit more about that and also the difference between what the uh, birth control pill does and then something like a copper IUD? Yeah, absolutely. So there's that, that's a lot of information packed no. into, that, into that one question. So <laughs> I'm going to unpack it a little bit. So <laughs> let's just start with, um, let's start with the pill and let's talk about how the pill works. Okay. So <clears throat> the way that, that your cycle works is the beginning of your cycle starts day one is when you start bleeding, when you have your period. Okay. And then we go 14 ish days. If you want to use a 28 day cycle, which we could have a whole nother cover, a whole nother conversation about how that is bogus in 24 to 35 days is normal. So mm-hmm. if you, there's a good chance you're not actually ovulating on day 14, but mm-hmm. let's just use a 28 day cycle for this example. So you ovulate on day 14 and then at day 28 is the end of your period and you start over again. So the first half of your cycle between bleeding and ovulating is the follicular phase. That's when the egg is developing and getting ready to be released from the ovary during ovulation. Estrogen is the dominant hormone during that part of your cycle. So estrogen is at its highest in your cycle before you ovulate. You, so then you ovulate and estrogen dips down and progesterone starts to rise. The way I think of progesterone is like the mortar in your uterus that holds all the cells together and really thickens your uterus so that if you do conceive that cycle, there's a good thick 
well vascularized, meaning a lot of blood flow going to the tissue lining of your uterus for the egg to implant into. It has a good base to build its roots, good, good soil, if you will. So estrogen, sorry, progesterone peaks after you ovulate and then comes back down right before you start your cycle again. Okay. So estrogen will go back up a little and have like a mini peak around, um, probably like day 21 ish as well. If you're having a 28 day cycle. So all of that to say your hormones very cyclically rise and fall, right? When you're taking oral birth control, you're getting a pulse of hormones every day. So the, the curve becomes more like a sawtooth. Every day when you take that pill, you're getting a spike in these hormones. So your body doesn't want a spike every day. It wants a cyclic diurnal, if you will, pattern that's very slow to rise and slow to fall. So with that being said, the hormones that you're getting in birth control are synthetic. They are not bioidentical in any stretch of the imagination. So what happens is you're, you have no hormones. Your hormones completely shut off. The connection between your brain and your ovaries stops because your brain sees these fake hormones in the bloodstream and it's like, okay, we don't need to make more. So it, it shuts off the connection telling the ovaries to make more actual hormone. So you kind of go into menopause in a sense kind of like yeah. a taboo thing to talk about. Like everyone yeah. likes to say your body just pretends that it's in, that it's pregnant. No, it doesn't. Because when you're pregnant, you have sky high, sky high levels of progesterone. Mm -hmm. But when you're on birth control, you kind of go into menopause. Mm -hmm. So your hormone levels are super low. That connection between your brain and your ovaries is completely shut off. On top of that, estrogen in the form of birth control is the most potent xenoestrogen. So a xenoestrogen is a synthetic chemical compound that when your body sees it, it thinks it's estrogen. So then we could get into this whole conversation about chemicals and fragrance and candles and plugins and all of that, right? But anything like fragrance or BPA or any of these environmental toxins, those are xenoestrogens. And we know those are toxic, but birth control is the most potent because it's specifically designed to look so similar to estrogen that it tricks your body. Mm -hmm. So even though you have super low natural hormone levels, you can still be in a state of estrogen dominance because of the, that, you know, estrogen. Mm -hmm. So we just end up in dominoes or a hamster on a wheel or whatever you want to call it of this, like going round and round pattern. Right. Mm -hmm. So then IUD is similarly ish, um, it was always the thought that the progest progestins or the fake progesterones stay in the uterus mm -hmm. localized, but we know now that that's really not true and that they can be systemic. Um, in like a copper IUD, that causes inflammation in the uterus. Mm -hmm. So it's inhospitable for sperm and it's inhospitable for implantation of a fertilized egg. Mm -hmm. But they're copper and copper can deplete zinc and copper can cause estrogen issues. So it's really just not as black and white and as simple as we think, but no pharmaceutical is. And a lot of supplements aren't either. Right. Right. So, um, it gets complex. <laughs> we yeah. could say that. Right. Well, I mean, this makes a lot of sense to me and and it also, I, I think that one of the most, you know, um, non-spoken consequences of these birth controls is that they all contribute to vitamin and mineral deficiencies. That's a huge, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's a really good point that you bring up. And so B vitamins, magnesium, the list goes on and on. And that is one of the large factors that I would say we see with post-birth control mm -hmm. issues is that women are just so nutrient deficient mm -hmm. when they get off birth control, right. that that can have issues with fertility and other symptoms that they're experiencing as well. Absolutely. Well, and one of the things that I really like to focus on, because I think mental health is such a 
you know, huge problem in the United States. We have so many individuals that are on depression and anxiety medication. And unfortunately, typically part of the root cause is a vitamin and mineral deficiency that is contributing to the increased pro, you know, prolonged anxiety and depression. And so if we're getting on a birth control pill or a IUD at a very early age, we're suppressing that normal hormonal function. We're suppressing absorption of vitamins and minerals. It's no wonder that all of these young ladies, by the time they're getting into their early twenties and in college and trying to find themselves, they're an absolute mess and they feel hopeless and helpless and have nowhere to turn. Like, no, you know, there's, because it's just, here's another prescription. Here's another prescription. And And I don't think it's recognized enough by the conventional model that the oral contraception could actually be playing into the rates of anxiety and depression that we're seeing. Absolutely. In in young adults. Yeah, absolutely. It it was really frightening because I recently had a visit to the OBGYN and unfortunately, um, I am in perimenopause and I had an absolutely beautiful, perfect, pristine cycle all the way up until last summer. And then all of the sudden things took a significant turn for the worse. And I was like, whoa, what the hell? Where are these symptoms coming from? What is happening to me? And I personally feel like I am completely lost in this body. I have a perspective that um, I have a, I have an idea of what I think might be contributing to what's been happening with me with a lot of conversations I've been having with other medical professionals who get curious and like to think outside of the box. Um, and that will, we'll have to save that for another yeah. conversation, <laughs> but um, cause it's very controversial, but anyway, With all of that being said, I went to my doctor and we were talking about it. And the first thing she wants to do is put me on a freaking birth control. I'm like, wait, what? I was like, I just told you about all of my vitamin and mineral deficiencies that I'm struggling with despite my efforts because of my compromised kidney function. And your first suggestion is, I was like, oh, I'm really sorry. I said, that's not going to work for me. And then she was very um, defensive. She got very defensive and I was very understanding and said, look, I understand you're time pressed. You've got more, there's 40 freaking people sitting out in your waiting room right now. And you've got 10 to 15 minutes scheduled with each one of them. So I get it. I understand that you don't have the time to go and do the research, but something's going to have to change within this paradigm and this model because it's breaking us. Yeah. You and know? it's going to crash. And I, I do think it's going to crash. Soon. I do too. I do too. I more, feel it. I feel yeah. it coming. And I more and it. more people. I mean, that's why, why we stay busy. That's why my practice tripled during the pandemic if mm-hmm. you will, mm-hmm. because people can see, people can see through, I mm-hmm. think we're finally getting to that point and And yeah, it goes back to kind of what I said in the beginning is I fault them to an extent, but also knowing like that's the confines of their education. And that's really all they learn is they don't learn about nutrition and they don't learn about um, nutrient deficiencies and things like that. And a little bit of that falls into the pharmacist's lap, but I have some good friends that are holistic pharmacists, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all things that they have learned outside of pharmacy school in yeah. their own nutritional training mm-hmm. to be able to counsel when patients come into the pharmacy based on what pharmaceuticals they're taking, what nutrients they should also be taking. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah, no, I I'm with you. I'm pretty confident that it's crumbling. And I think that the more, you know, conversations like this that are had and the more access people have to the information, which we know nowadays is becoming harder and harder to yeah. make happen. But, um, what people don't realize is that, you know, within that education system, the research that is happening is being funded and there's a lot of bias behind it. And so you and I both know going through, you know, um, higher education that as a researcher, you can take any hypothesis and prove it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's really easy to produce information that's going to validate whatever outcome you want to get yeah. accepted by, you know, society. And so unfortunately, 
a lot of doctors, they dedicate so much time and energy and financial means to the system that it's very difficult for them to accept that there could be biased and that the information might be wrong and it might be directing us in the wrong path. Um, and so I think that's also one of the barriers that comes about, you know, we dedicate so much time. I myself, just to become a registered dietitian, spent seven years in the education. You know, it's a required right. master's to become yeah. a registered dietitian now. And that's quite a lot of, of um, commitment. And so Luckily, I'm an open-minded person who went into it knowing that I was going to be taught a bunch of bullshit that wasn't true. And that once I jumped through all the hoops and became licensed, then I could practice using the evidence-based research that I believe in and that worked for me. Yeah. So I just think more people need to understand that component of the system so that they can kind of peel back, you know, the mm -hmm. layers and say, oh, maybe there is more. Instead of yeah. saying trust or follow the research, it really needs to be follow the money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I have this conversation with people a lot regarding food. Mm -hmm. And I always explain like, look, I could put, I could cover my desk in research that says you should be a vegan. Mm -hmm. And I could cover my desk in research that says that you should be a carnivore. Yep. Yeah. So what we really need to do is figure out what your body needs, which exactly. is not going to be the same as the last person that was in my office. Mm -hmm. And we need to pick what works best for you, right? Absolutely. Based on the conditions that you have and what you're trying to heal and what you're trying to go through. And so there's a lot of research out there, right? And we mm -hmm. can usually find what we want to support our case. Whatever mm -hmm. case we're trying to make, you can probably find something, right? Absolutely. Um, whether it's good research or not. And I think that's an important thing to know, but <clears throat> I also think it's really important to know when you're kind of in this alternative space is like, okay, there might not be a clinical study that proves like this supplement helps with that. Mm -hmm. But what about clinical experience, mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of what I do, I learned from my elders in the profession, naturopaths that have been practicing or naturopathic doctors that have been practicing for 40, 50 years. And they've been doing this for 50 years with great clinical outcomes. Mm -hmm. So where does that come into play, right? Like right. that's important too, just because we don't have a paper to prove it doesn't mean it's not efficacious. Right. And that's not the most like scientific way to approach it, but so we are the modern day witches, basically, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're the modern day witches. It's really crazy because I mm -hmm. myself have followed this holistic path and I've done a lot of research outside of the United States and really explored what's happening in Eastern medicine. And, um, you know, it's crazy because it really wasn't until after World War II that the conventional model really took such a huge yeah. shift. And many people have no clue that during World War II, the German scientists were developing all of these chemical agents. They had a surplus of them once the war yeah. was over and yeah. they found ways to legally redistribute them and package them for profit, which turned into our pharmaceutical right. whole you know, plethora, as well as agricultural with uh, fertilizers and pesticides. And, you know, when, when people hear that, they're like, no way, this is a crazy fact. Okay. I was reading about this and I am married to a guy who is from Italy and I was telling my assistant and him like, oh my God, I had no idea that the German scientists were behind, you know, Monsanto and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I said, and so anyway, I said something and my husband looked at me, he goes, they did not teach you that in school. <laughs> and I was like, what? No, <laughs> no, we did not learn anything about that here. And he was like, oh, well, we were taught that, you know, during our education. And I was just like, what? Oh my gosh. They have hid so much from us. It's crazy. Yeah. Those are some deep rabbit holes when you go down too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but they're, they're very educational ones. And when you yeah. become empowered with that information, it allows for you to be a stronger advocate and to have the ability to really hear that intuitive voice that's calling you to what you actually need. So back to the point you mentioned earlier that, you know, we can find evidence to support any claim, any diet, any any kind of um, solution, but 
it's not a one size all fit approach. And because we've become so disconnected from our physical bodies, it's very difficult for people to actually integrate, get back in and sense and feel where they're actually feeling what their body is trying to tell them. Hey guys, I'm going to interrupt this episode for a really brief message and to introduce you to today's amazing podcast sponsors, WaveBlock. If you know me, you know that I am all about reducing toxicity. And to be perfectly honest with you, this whole 5G thing has got me a little freaked out. Did you know that your phone and AirPods emit radiation? According to the CDC, your phone uses radio frequency radiation to transmit its signal. This cloud of radiation just sits outside your brain the entire time you're using your phone or on your AirPods. If you listen to podcasts, talk on your phone, do Zoom calls all day, that exposure really starts to add up. The frequencies from your phone actually pass through your brain, which is really scary and can cause negative effects like headaches, foggy brain, fatigue, and other issues. I love using my WaveBlock EMF protective stickers for my phone and AirPods to direct these harmful frequencies away from my body and my brain. WaveBlock's accredited lab-tested line of products help significantly reduce the amount of radiation you are getting exposed to with their easy-to-apply EMF blocking stickers. They have protection for AirPods, AirPod Pros, and all of the recent iPhone models. These stickers don't interfere with anything, so you can still use your phone case or whatever it is that you like. They just offer all day protection. Make sure you head to waveblock.com and take advantage of a 20% discount using the code Heather. I'll make sure to link it in the show notes for easy access. So make sure you head to waveblock.com to get your 20% off discount and use the code Heather. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And into the not being one size fits all approach, I think when people transition to say like, okay, someone wants to go off of birth control, right? And they're like, okay, I'm ready to do it. I need support. It's not gonna like necessarily be the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be really upfront with calling things, calling that out, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's gonna take work. It's gonna take time. Like you might be the person whose hormones don't turn back on for three weeks or three months, you right. might be the person who gets really severe acne after going off birth control. You might be the person that gets PCOS like symptoms after go mm-hmm. after going off birth control, which is controversial, but we see it, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. who, we don't know who you're going to be when you go off. Um, so when I'm working with women through this, I'm doing like a lot of liver detox and a lot of liver support and neurological support and endocrine and trying to turn those pathways back on. But it's, to the point of in the conventional model, we often get a quick fix with a pill, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't get that on this side of the fence because Mm -hmm. we're not suppressing, we're healing. Right. And there's a difference and it takes time. And I think two people like a very linear upward healing process where we start today and it just goes up, 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 up. Mm -hmm. And that never happens. Very, Mm -hmm. very rarely does that happen with a client that I work with. It's very much more like up and down, up and down, up and down. And I can just notice the patterns and working with people now. It's like, yes, the first week, three weeks are like, great. You're like on a honeymoon. You feel so good. And then a rut comes and it's Mm -hmm. with every person like week four or five. It's like, we're in a rut. And I'm, I'm telling them, I'm going to pull you out. I promise. Like, just stick with me. We're going to come out and we come up and it it happens every time is these patterns. So Mm -hmm. You got to be ready for that. And I don't share that to deter anyone who's ready to go off their birth control because I think, you know, that's potentially a good option, but you just got to be prepared for the work that comes along with it. Yeah. And I really respect you for bringing that to our attention because I myself am a really big advocate for explaining like, look, this isn't a quick fix. This is, this is a a much slower process where you're going to have to have patience. You're going to have to have compassion. You're going to have to have grace. And these aren't things we're really taught in society because we're so focused on instant gratification that we get very frustrated. And then we end up sabotaging, you know, in order to deal with it. And so I think that that's fabulous advice for anyone who is listening. I know that there are so many women out there that are in desperate desire to get off of the pill. But when they go to their doctor and suggest that the doctor typically talks them out of it. And so they just stay on it and they're miserable, but they're so fearful to get off it. 
So could you speak directly, just maybe a couple of tips yeah. to that individual um, who is contemplating like what, what kind of to expect? Can you just yeah. address, you did address it. I'm not going to dismiss that you didn't address it, but yeah, it, it's going to be different for everybody, right? Like, like mm-hmm. I said, there might be the woman who comes off and gets pregnant the next month and mm-hmm. is no big deal. And there might be the woman who comes off and has like insane acne uh, that she's never had before in her whole entire life, two or three months later. Mm-hmm. Um, what I do when I'm working with people is I prep them before they go off. So I'm supporting their liver and you gotta, you gotta know though, if you're using it for contraception and you start detoxing your liver, it may not be effective for contraception. Mm-hmm. So you got to mm-hmm. be prepared with all of these things, right? So um, I'm doing lots of liver detox and liver support. And I do that ho- with homeopathy for the most part. Mm-hmm. Uh, but castor oil packs are wonderful to do. Uh, castor oil packs support the liver. It's very well absorbed through the skin. I have lots of information on my Instagram page about how to do castor oil packs. I have a whole highlight on it. Um, so I'm doing that. I'm re-mineralizing them and giving them vitamins and nutrients so that their body can handle coming off and isn't as shocked, right? Um, We're doing adrenal support, uh, thyroid support, because the thyroid and the adrenals in the ovaries are all part of the endocrine system and they're very tightly intertwined. I always consider them a braid. There's, mm-hmm. there's how I explain them. So when one of them gets out of balance, the other two get out of balance. And that's all about the way that the brain talks to the pituitary, which then talks to those uh, glands. So, <clears throat> or organs. So mm-hmm. the, the ovaries in that braid are not in a happy state, right? They're struggling. So that causes the adrenals to be stressed and the thyroid to be stressed. So I'm supporting those other organs and making sure that they're really well supported mm-hmm. as we're going to embark on that journey. Right. And then I do a lot of liver support with my clients because I just find that the liver is the garbage can and everyone's liver is congested and full of junk. And the liver has hundreds of jobs in the body. So yeah. if the liver is congested with the xenoestrogen from your birth control, then it's not functioning properly. And it's just like a whole domino effect. Oh, yeah. And then in Chinese medicine, different organs hold different emotions. So mm-hmm. the liver is the organ of anger. So I find almost always, I will go out on that limb and say that, that almost always women that have period problems have some sort of suppressed or even not suppressed anger. Mm -hmm. When we get in and we address that emotional root cause, that is where the true deep healing happens. And then I find those transitions off are not as stressful on the body. Mm -hmm. We're just really digging in from the beginning and preparing the body. I love the fact that you just brought up the connection between the organs and the emotions. This is something that I have in my nutrition assessment form that I always evaluate where I have the different organ systems and ask people to indicate, you know, where they feel they're having the biggest issues. And then it always correlates with the emotional state. And and as a practitioner, it's fabulous information to have because it allows us to identify what that root cause is. Everything is a vibrational frequency. These emotions that we're experiencing are sending very specific signals to ourselves and the way that they're going to respond and react. And, And so it's funny because unfortunately the conventional model has created us like a, uh, they've compartmentalized us and they have not addressed the big picture, including that aura field that exists around us that we also know as quantum physics. So I think that the more information that comes out, the better supported, you know, practitioners will be with getting the society to really accept, Hey, we totally dropped out and took away the whole component of quantum physics. And we have to, we have to bring that back in and we have to rethink this whole approach because ultimately that is the root of how everything else is going to behave. Yeah. And I like that you said that everything is so compartmentalized because I can't tell you how much time in my day, every day I spend pulling all of the information together from all of the different specialists to just see it all as one picture. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, wow, if they just looked at this for for (laughs) two more minutes into more of like a whole body connection and, and how the whole body is connected. I, as an example, so my oldest daughter had a kidney removed when she was a year old because it was born with a congenital abnormality. And so they did her surgery, removed her kidney. And then she had like a lot of 
gut bloating. Mm-hmm. She was also on a lot of antibiotics. And so I know she had dysbiosis, but I was also in my second year of medical school and like overwhelmed and like life is chaos. Right. So you can't, right. like, super I pretty. can imagine. And so I will never forget being in the pediatric urologist's office. And he, I'm like, asking him like, what do you think? Like, why is her kidney or why is her gut so bloated? Like what's going on? And he was like, well, it's not her kidney. So I don't know what to tell you. It's out of my department. <laughs> okay, so you're not going to be helpful whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Like just no capacity to think outside of their system. And I see that all the time. Like another example, my dad just had surgery on his knee for a tour of meniscus and he's had a lot of issues since with, with the knee and the, <clears throat> the surgeon that did his surgery finally was like, I don't know. It's a rheumatology thing. I'm going to have to send you over there. I'm, I'm done. Like I can't do anything else for you. And he's got this huge swollen knee and, oh you know, there's gotta be a connection and they just like, don't have the capacity to see that connection. So, so much of my day, I just spend pulling all the pieces together for people and being like that support for them too. And I'm sure you do the same thing. Exactly. I like to, I like to tease when someone's signing up with me. Now I get to play detective where I get to lay Mm -hmm. all of the evidence out. Like literally it looks like a crime scene happened, you know, in my home where literally the evidence is just spread out and I'm literally trying to connect the dots and get to what the root issue is because we all have limited energy. We all have very limited time and most of us have limited resources. So we have to be very realistic with the approach that we take in order to yield the the results that are going to give us the biggest bang for our buck to keep us motivated and inspired to keep wanting to go forward. And that, you know, I, in my opinion, that's a really key piece of this puzzle to help facilitate healing in individuals without that. Um, you're just literally hitting your head, you know. Just and I over think and over. In all fairness, too, there is a significant shortage of primary care physicians and physicians in general. And that kind of speaks to the need um, for anyone that's familiar that's listening with licensing laws for naturopathic doctors specifically. It's like we don't have a license in every mm-hmm. state. So I'm in Michigan. Mm-hmm. So technically, I don't diagnose or treat because I legally can't, even right. though I hold an Oregon license where I could write a narcotic if I wanted to. Right. Um, so there's just so many pieces to the puzzle of the conventional model. And that's a huge part, I believe, of why we're in this situation that we are is mm-hmm. that my initial intake with a new client is two to three hours. Mm -hmm. So because of the way insurance works, a conventional doc cannot afford to spend two to three hours with you, right? No, you get maybe 20 minutes if you're lucky as a new patient. Right. So I think there's just so many moving pieces to the broken system Mm -hmm. and we have to be fair to them. But at the same time, like there has to be change and the only way there's going to be change is if we demand that there's change. Right. And, it, and I think that in order to demand the change, you have to have the awareness and the understanding yeah. of what the actual problem is. And I, I want to go back to this piece about, you know, everyone being a specialist and that you can't just go and have everything addressed at one time for the most part, they send you out. And one of the things that I've seen as a dietitian that really bothers me with this system is that because you're going from doctor to doctor to doctor, and each one is treating a specific organ and they're not multidisciplinary communicating with each other and game planning, this creates a problem with polypharmacia where we're getting multiple prescriptions prescribed to us. We're not really sure about the interactions, the cross interactions and challenges with all of these medications and especially how they contribute to our nutritional status with vitamin and mineral losses, you know? So, um, I think that that's important for people to understand that they have to really be mindful about outsourcing to all these different places and how, whatever the solution potentially is, it might be interfering or interacting with someone else's plan. Yeah, absolutely. And I, my thought went when you were speaking about that too, is most pharmaceuticals are developed to mimic an herb Mm -hmm. over 75% of them. And so many times in my practice, I can use an herb or a nutraceutical to do more than one thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we're looking at the whole body, we can minimize the amount of things that we need to use for somebody. Right. Because we can get two birds with one stone so often. 
one. Absolutely. Right? Like polypharmacy unnecessary. And I do think another piece too, when we come, when it comes to herbs is, is very easy for, for alternative practitioners to use herbs like drugs, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean you're getting the root cause. Absolutely. And I think that's another piece that is so commonly missed maybe from the public's view or even with a lot of functional practitioners is like, yeah, we could give you a statin, a statin, but let's just give you red yeast rice instead. Well, you didn't, you didn't actually fix anything. You yeah. just pose an herb <laughs> over yep. a drug. It's really not that much better. I mean, it is a little bit, but you know, so I think too, like for those of you that are listening, if you're working with a provider who's doing that, that's like another red flag to you is like, okay, we're not actually getting at the root cause. We're just using a different band-aid solution. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I am so, so grateful that you did bring this up and I'm going to use a recent client as an example of this. Yeah. So this individual, you know, has been very scorned from the conventional medical field and refuses to participate and has outsourced her health to functional practitioners. And as a result, when she came to me, she was taking a little, I want to say it was about 33 different supplements a day. Oh. And so when I evaluated her supplement regimen, I was frightened. I was like, oh my gosh, this is absolutely no wonder she's having X, Y, Z. And so before we even made any changes to her diet, I said, look, here's what's going to have to happen. I'm going to be altering your supplement regimen. And I literally knocked it down to less than a third of what she was doing. Like I picked out just the absolutely potentially necessary things within 24 hours of taking her off all of these supplements. She messaged me and she was like, um, all of my bloating, all of the gas, all of the GERD, all of these multiple bowel movements that I have been suffering with. She's like, they're gone. And I was like, thank God. You know, I see that. I see that happen too is it's easy. Like if we're being completely honest, it's easy to get somebody on a lot of supplements. I mean, oh, that's yeah. like a amount of supplements, but I will every once in a while have my clients just take a complete supplement break. Like let's just, mm-hmm. just don't take anything for a week and let's see how you feel and how you do and what your body's doing. Because I always tell my clients when I start with them, my goal is not to have you on a whole bunch of supplements for the rest yes. of your life. Again, yeah. if you need that for the most part, we haven't really healed your body. I mean, there's some rare instances where like, okay, you might need this support, but Um, for the most part, like we might need to use higher doses of things, more things in the beginning. And then we need to be able to taper you off of them. Mm -hmm. We're just using them to help ease the journey where we're trying to get to go. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Such, such fabulous points. I'm, I'm very impressed with your perception and, and practice values and morals. I think that it's beautiful. And I think that you're on the forefront of future healthcare and what will become the standard. I think that you are embodying that example for others to really follow and embrace. And I just think it's beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's a fun journey to be on. Some days it has its challenges, but you got to have thick skin and just keep going. (laughs) So for all those ladies out there listening right now who are ready to boot the birth control and start taking their health into their own hands and empowering themselves Mm -hmm. through more holistic lifestyle changes, what are some of the best tips that you can give individuals to have the courage, have the uh, motivation to want to get started? Yeah. So I think like the first thing comes down to educating yourself. So when you go in to talk to your provider, you're confident in the decisions that you're making for yourself Mm -hmm. and that, that research can be a little overwhelming. So there are so many great Instagram accounts to follow where you can get such good, like, like just digestible amounts of Mm -hmm. information before you're ready to tackle research or things like that. And I don't even think you need to tackle the research to decide that you want to go off of, um, those oral contraception, whether it be an IUD or the pill. I think Mm -hmm. another big piece for women is I hear this all the time. Like if I go off birth control, what am I going to use for contraception? That is just like deer in headlights. Right. Mm -hmm. So to me, I'm like, oh my goodness, like it doesn't have to be that way. Right. Like the natural family planning or the fertility awareness method. Like there are so many different ways that you can track your fertility. And I think one of the biggest disservices 
ever done to women is that they're not taught about their bodies. Mm -hmm. Women do not know when they're ovulating. Women don't, women just, we're not connected with our bodies as a whole, I would say. And I would say like, that is like problem number one, right? Mm -hmm. So before you decide to go off, I think you need to get a really good period tracking app and you need to get really comfortable with what your cervical fluid is doing and how it looks here and now. And that's going to shift as you go off of birth control, most likely. Right. Mm-hmm. Especially like if you have a progesterone IUD, it makes it very thick, your, your cervical fluid, very thick and things like that. So I think like starting to get in tune with what your body's doing and being open to your body, whether you want to do basal body temperature, whatever the thing, things that you want to do and just start getting into a pattern of tracking that. So I think the more confident women feel in their ability to have control over their cycle and their fertility is one of the most important things for getting off of birth control. And you also like, I think it's important for women to know you can't get pregnant every month, every day of the cycle. Like, no, you're fertile one day and I'm sorry. It's okay. And, um, sperm can live in cervical fluid for five days. Mm -hmm. So if you have cervical fluid there, you could be fertile that day. Right. So I think like getting that understanding is so important, uh, to feeling confident in making that choice to go off birth control, if that's what you're using it for. Um, and then, like I said, like just getting your minerals back in balance, like just start on some basic minerals. Mm -hmm. Um, is that simple? Really just like start remineralizing your body and doing some castor oil packs and just start supporting yourself in those little ways and just be there for the process, right? Like don't fear what your body's going to do because you have to face it at some point. And if you wait till menopause to go off, it's probably going to be worse. So just like do it now and get it over with. Right. Yeah. And just like get a provider, like a naturopath or a functional med provider or somebody on your team that can really help you in the journey to getting off birth control. And if they're confident in you going off, it's going to increase your confidence because you're not alone. It's like that camaraderie of having support and doing it with somebody. Absolutely. Such fabulous tips. Great advice. I think that anyone out there who is contemplating getting off birth control pill, um, you have really provided a lot of fabulous knowledge that they can empower themselves with to feel more confident with that choice and have tangible solutions to start you know, um, interacting with to get that healing journey going into the right path. So I appreciate your expertise and um, all of the amazing work you're doing. So where can the audience find you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on Instagram. My tag is at Dr. Nicole Morris. Nicole has an H in it. So Dr. Nicole Morris. Um, my website is morrisnaturalhealth.com. You can apply to be a client there if you're interested in having someone support you and coming off birth control. And I also launched a supplement company at the end of last year. So you can find all of my supplements at shopdrmorris.com. Um, those are the best ways to get me can Google Amazing. me. You'll find me. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I will that. make sure to attach all of your information in the show notes. So it makes Wonderful. it easy for individuals to find you. And again, thank you so much for your time, you. for your expertise, for just your beautiful light that you shine and the truth that you speak. Um, it's, it's so honorable and, and just such a pleasure to witness. Thank you. It was really a joy to be here and talk with you. And hopefully your listeners are going to get some good tips to take away today. I feel um, confident with that. To with you again. It was great. I really appreciate it. Yes, my pleasure. Thanks for joining us on the Think Yourself Healthy podcast. Make sure you leave a review and let me know what you think. I love reading your feedback. Come hang out with me on Instagram at Heather Duranja. And don't forget to take a screenshot that you're listening to the podcast and tag me. I love to share it. See you on the next episode.